Good evening. I'm Ann Knegendorf from the Kansas City Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight. Our guest is Jenny Doan of the Missouri Star Quilt Company in Hamilton, Missouri, not too far from Kansas City. And I'd say that Jenny is the founder of the company, but the story is more complicated than that. <laughs> A little bit more. <laughs> the story we'll hear tonight as we discuss her new book, How to Stitch an American Dream. Um, the Missouri Star Quilt Company is part of the national quilting industry, an industry estimated to be worth about $4.2 billion a year. Um, and in 2019, Forbes reported that Missouri Star's annual revenue alone was at about $40 million. I don't know if that's still true. That was a couple <laughs> years ago now. Um, but Jenny's YouTube channel, on which she gives weekly quilting tutorials, has about 807,000 subscribers, and many of her videos have millions of views. So welcome, Jenny. It's great to have you with us oh, tonight. it's wonderful to be here. Good. Um, and do you make it to Kansas City very often? Yes, this is our city. So when we go to some place, you know, every place where we live, every place you have to drive to. So Kansas City is about an hour and 15 minutes for us. And yep, this is where we go. If we want date night, whatever movie, this is where we have to go. So is this date night tonight? Well, it will end up that way, that's for sure. <laughs> do you have a plan? Now we're just going to go get something to eat after this. Okay, I think I will too. Maybe we'll run into each other <laughs> there again. Go. There you go. Um, so it's been exactly a year since the last time we spoke. The last time I talked to you, um, I visited Hamilton. I think I was in the exact room where you do your YouTube tutorials. And we talked for a radio piece for KCUR. Oh, okay. okay. And, um, and I mainly then wanted to know how Hamilton was doing during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, because it's a, it's a very small town. What, 1,500 people? About 1,500, yeah. 1,500 people. And um, for a while, pre-pandemic, um, you had, what was it, like 8,000 people a week coming yeah, in? Yeah, we have a lot of people come. To visit. Um, and it was, but it turns out it was doing great even during the it pandemic. It really was doing great. Yeah, we closed the stores down for a couple of years. And those, what, what, the, the coolest thing about this was that all of our employees who worked in town were able to go out to the warehouse. We never had to lay a single person off and we never stopped hiring. And so, uh, so you know, because people are home, the online part of our business picked up and which it was always the, it was always the breadwinner anyway. You know, the town is like the sprinkles on the cake, you know, but. Um, but the online business was good, but it got, it got very good. And so um, we never, you know, we never had to lay anybody off, which I think is a little miracle in this time of, I think it's a big you know, miracle. And, and business, uh, the uptick was something like 40%, wasn't yeah, it? it was about 40%. And is it still that way now? Yeah. That's, that's really amazing. And you had, is it 14 quilting stores? We have, yeah, where well, there's about 14 shops. And each shop is fabric specific. So it is, um, you know, it has, you know, one will have mercantile type fabric, which is like the reproduction fabrics. So one will have solids, one will have Christmas, children's backing. You know, every, every type of fabric gets its own shop. So it's, it's, it's very amazing. fun for people to come see. Well, the only time I went, everything was closed. Yeah, so, I'm so, the, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came to talk to you. So, I mean, I had that great benefit of going right. during that time. <laughs> Today would have been a great day to come. The weather's great here, you know, right now, which is, which is like a little miracle in itself. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, it, everything's opened up and we're back going. Okay, good. Well, that's wonderful. And so what's it looking like as far as visitors go? So uh, so the, the winter months are never our big visitor months. So, you know, you'll drive down the street and, and you still see lots of cars from lots of different places, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not as busy as it is in the summertime for sure. You know, we have kind of a skeleton crew in our shops and, um, you know, it just, it's fine. It works out great. We still have tr retreats, so we still have 40 women coming to you know, sleep and sew in Hamilton every single week, you know, whether it's winter or not, people still want to come and do that, so. Great, that's great. What a good community. Um, <clears throat> so I've been really looking forward to talking to you about how to stitch an American dream, um, which is a memoir, right? Um, and so I guess, you know, to start off with, why would a quilter think to write a book? Why did you think, oh, this is the time? Actually, um, uh, I think, you know, there's, there's, again, there's a little bit more to it than that. Sure. Um, you know, what, it wasn't ever my plan to write a book. You know, um, Alan actually thought about it, thought it might be a, a cool thing to do. Um, your fourth child? Is your... Uh, 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 yes. No, oh, did fifth. I? Oh, I almost had it right. Okay, fifth son, or fifth child. Fifth okay, child. so it was yeah. Alan, this was Alan's idea, and Alan comes up a lot in this book. Yes, and he, um, he actually, we... We started kind of playing with the idea, and then the people who wrote um, Joanna Gaines' book, 
they contacted us. And then we had to, like we got to interview several different authors. Oh. Who then, you know, we chose one and... For a um, ghost writer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he came out and spent a great deal of time with me. And came out several times, actually, and talked and we... He wrote and we talked and he, he taped everything I said and, you know, took that. He wanted it to be my voice, my, uh, my work. And, and, um, and then I got to edit everything and, you know, it was, it was much more uh, interesting. But the thing I think that's cool about it that I, that I didn't realize at the time, uh, my mother recently passed away a few months ago and I would love to have had a, uh, a record of her life something that she'd written down. You know, they have all kinds of things you can do online now, but you know, she's 89 and um, she was a, an amazing woman, genealogist, uh, Swedish genealogist, you know, and I mean, she just did some really cool things in her life. And I would love to have a record of that. Well, my children have that. Yeah, and while do. it's not all inclusive. Oh, it almost um, is. It, it is, you know, there's a lot more stories than that, but, sure. it's, but it's, you know, it tells a great overview of my life. And what I came to realize is that uh, for most of my children, for most of all of our children, they really know you from the age of 10 to when they leave. You know, they don't know you as a young mom. They don't remember that. They don't know you before that. And they don't know you after they're gone. And so, you know, I had my children reading this book coming and saying to me, Mom, this is, you're amazing, you know? And I mean, it's just like, huh. You know, I didn't realize you didn't know those things, you know, That's but funny. a lot of that stuff you don't talk about. But the funniest, I have a little grandson who is about 11, Ezra, and he actually has read this book several times. And he finally, he comes to me and he's like, I have a question, Grandma. I just cannot figure this out. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. And I'm just like thinking, what, what on earth is he talking about, you know? And he said, I just have to know, what is a waterbed? <laughs> and I was just like, that's your question, you know? And you have a waterbed uh, yeah, scene I'm like, with, with, I'm like, on the night of your honeymoon, right? right? Yeah, and that's I'm, pretty funny. And I'm just like, honey, it's like a giant Ziploc <laughs> bag the size of your parents' bed. And he's like, why, why would anybody sleep in that? I'm like, it was a thing. <laughs> Nobody I would. Know. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, so many of these stories are so personal. And I you know you've done a lot of speaking engagements. And, and I think you talk about some of these personal things, um, like your, your very early, your decision to marry somebody kind of on a dare when you were 19 years old. And now that turned abusive. And it was just, you know, it's terrible you know, a few years in your life, but are there, I mean, are there things that you found yourself telling differently in writing that you didn't, you wouldn't have said to an auditorium of people? So there were a lot of things that I said yeah. in writing. As a matter of fact, the hardest thing for me to do with this whole book process was actually to read it for Audible. Because we, you can write those things and you can talk about those things, but when you actually say them out loud, it was so, parts of it were so emotional for me um, because it's not, they're not things I, you know, I'm a Pollyanna, so I like, get on with it and move forward, you know, we're doing the best we can and we just get up every day and try to do the best we can. Uh -huh. And so, um, so I'm pretty positive as far as that goes. And so people ask me, they're like, why did you feel to put that in there? And I'm like, I'm, I'm not sure. It was like gut and heart and it was the questions that Mark was asking me and things like that. And, you know, and as we talked about those things, you know, I got thinking about for so many people, we, I mean, we all have scars, we all have things and we spend a lot of our lifetime trying to hide those things. When in reality, when you share them and you open them up, it lets other people go, oh, you know what? She lived through this and she's fine. I'm going to be fine. Or, you know, or maybe it's, you know, it's just something like that where they can look at what you've been through and they're like, oh, okay, well, this happened, but, you know, she survived and, and I can do this, you That's know. An example of something like that you well, decided like to abuse, include. You know. So you hadn't really talked much about no, that. No, no, I hadn't really talked much about that, you know, because I, I mean, I, that was a very short period of my life. And then like Ron and I've been married 41 years, going on 42 years. And so we've been married a long time mm -hmm. to have this little bite be the focus of anything. Yeah, you but wouldn't you know, want that when, to be the focus because you were only 19 years old, right? right? You know, and you, I, and I was, it was a total stranger. So it wasn't even somebody you had a relationship with. I, I just had to tell you, you know, it, so many times since then I've thought, what was I thinking? And my <laughs> parents were just, they were just like stunned because I've, I've always done everything just what I was supposed to be doing, you know? And um, yeah, they were just stunned. And, I'm sure. And so then I was like, well, I'm gonna make the best of this, you know, and, you know, and things just kind of, uh, you know, took a dive bomb, but uh, I still thought, you know, I can do it, I can fix it, I can be better, I can try harder. And that's the trap that I think, you know, when women are abused that they fall into, you know, it's all about what they can do to be better. Yeah. And, um, and I think to voice that out loud, you know, there's a lot of women who've been through that where they're just like, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. You know, that happened to me too. 
Well, I mean, you, you seem to be very, very relatable. The whole book is, is you being relatable on a number of levels. And so it seems like that particular episode, that time in your life, um, maybe one of the things that I thought of that would have been maybe hardest for you was that you do put the family relationships all the way at the top of your list. Like yeah. family comes first, family relationships are the most important thing. And then you had this thing happen um, and th then that man fathered your first two children. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that creates this this rift then in that belief system right. you know, that, that the family needs to come first in that relationship. So that must have been very, very difficult, but also totally relatable. Yeah, it was a tough time. Yeah. But you know, lot, it happens to lots of us and we, and we managed to get through it. Yeah, and, and you have seven children? Seven children now. Yep, seven children. Our oldest boy is adopted and um, he is my sister's son and he just lived with us from the time he was little and we just kind of kept hoping she'd get her life together and it just didn't really happen and so he had been living with us all this time and we're like let's just make this permanent you know and so um, yeah. So I he, think you say in the book what's one more right? Yeah I mean honestly uh -huh. you know people say all the time how did you do it with that many children and I'm like once you get past two because you have two arms three is the hardest because you know you only have two arms, but once you get past three, you could have a, a hundred. It wouldn't make any difference. You got helpers. Okay. You got things going on. You just cut that hamburger patty a little thinner. You know, I mean, it's just like everybody survives. <laughs> and with seven kids, so you had to model cheerfulness and resourcefulness, which is a thread throughout the entire book. And, um, and I wondered if you'd read this one part that really seemed to exemplify that, that, that resourcefulness. That just really is my personality. You yeah, know, and your personality, some people, okay. Some people don't have that personality, but I really do have that, well, let's just make the best of this personality. That is my personality. So in this one part, you know, you, you say, whatever they did, that what is the big batch, Doan's big batch cookies. And yes. you realize, so you weren't only feeding your seven children, but the kids of the neighborhood also. And so you had this huge, a dozen eggs. Oh my gosh, yes. That went so into I, this recipe. Well, in a normal recipe, it makes like three dozen. That's yeah. like three kids, three cookies for each kid, you know? Uh -huh. And I'm like, no, this is never gonna work. I've gotta have way more than this. Cause I wanted, you know, I married this guy who thought, you know, his dream girl would always have a full cookie jar. You know, <laughs> my cookie jar was never full. Well, he's because nodding, I, I so he still so thinks many that. People, I had so many people eating cookies, you know? Uh -huh. And so I developed this recipe that was like, it was like, you know, not, not even quadrupled, even bigger than that. And I had a big bread bowl, yeah. you know, and I would make it and make my cookies in this big bowl. And literally we would bake all night and they'd last, you know, you'd have cookies for lunches and things like that. Now when we bake it, we literally roll them in rolls and put them in the freezer and we have cookies for a long time. But, but you needed a commercial mixer. We did. You needed oh, a yes. commercial mixer and you, you couldn't afford that. Yeah. Um, so, so I wondered if you'd read this part, which to me is just so much. Yeah, we had those little mixers and like every six they weeks, would break, right? I had to go get a new one because they couldn't handle what I was trying to make them do every day. That's amazing. Because that's really is how you feed a big family is you do it all yourself. You make your bread, you know, you make your own tortillas. You do all that, all that stuff yourself because flour is a lot cheaper than anything prepackaged. And so I, you know, so I was constantly buying a new one. I'm like, this is just never going to work. We need a big mixer. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you would read just this page, that would be great to sure. tell all about what you did to, to get that mixer. We were in the car when I noticed there was a whole lot of building going on around our town. I turned off the road and I drove down to one of those construction sites and I offered to do some work for them to clean up the houses once they were done building for them. For them. Uh, they said yes. Whenever a construction crew was finished, they would give me a call. I would gather up all my children and we, we would go down and clean that house as a family. With all those hands working together, it didn't take us very long and we got $20 a house. We saved that $20 and then waited for the next one. By the end of the summer, we had made enough money to buy a KitchenAid. The day that we brought it home, we all celebrated with a special Doan's Big Batch. And from then on, every time we needed to mix things, we just would turn on the mixer and it would work every time. I just loved that. I have to tell you a funny story about this though. So um, my little son, Jacob, so when Natalie got married, um, Jacob and- Natalie's the oldest Natalie's daughter? Natalie's the oldest girl. Okay. And when she well, got married- this. Okay. Yeah, you're pretty good at this. <laughs> when she got married, um, Jacob and Josh were probably, I don't know, six or eight, eight or 10, something like that. And they went over to Natalie's house to visit her once she was this married woman, you know. And they came home and they go, mom, you are gonna die when you hear this. Natalie has a mixer you can hold in your hand. You can hold the mixer in your hand. And I looked at him and I said, really? Because they were too little to remember that we did this. You know, nobody remembers before they're eight. And so 
And so they were just so excited about this handheld mixer. And I'm like, yeah, I remember. I know that. You know, it was just so funny that they thought it was this huge <laughs> novel thing. And that was the one thing I'd been trying to get rid of, you know. And, and it broke we'll, over and over that for broke you. broke over and over. Well, and so that kind of thinking of having to be innovative and having to look for opportunities and do that as a family, that really influenced your business model oh, gosh, eventually. Yeah. So can you say how, how that prepped you for what would come later? And not necessarily you know, in length, but at length, right? right now because I have many more questions about that. Well, we, were, we were put in a position of having to homeschool our children um, for a while. And, uh, and one of the things I told them is that if you can read, you can learn anything. Anything is a learned skill. And if you can read, you can learn anything. And so for, for my children, that's really how we do things. And my kids are really good at knowing what they don't know. And so in business, you know, you'd go along and you would do something. And all of a sudden, it's like, Oh my gosh, we need, we need help with this. You know, I can remember Alan, our first hire was somebody to help us clean. And I said to him, don't worry about it, Al. I'll come in earlier, I'll stay later, you know. And he said, mom, you are more valuable to me creating than you are cleaning. So you create and we'll hire somebody else to do that. And it was the first time I saw the worth really of what I was doing for the company because I was just the mom. I was just doing what they needed me to do. And, and you're um, used to doing a whole bunch of things. Oh, sure. I, you know, everything. And I could do anything, yeah. And, it, and in a home, you do do everything. And so for, um, for the work part of it, you know, it's like all of a sudden we had people who were doing specific things. And that actually was really hard for me. You know, Alan, I can remember having the conversation with him lots of times saying, you've got to let people do their jobs. You can't do everything, you know. And that is something we really had to learn. I bet it was. Yeah, it was tough. And tough so that... Is it, are you 12 or 13 years into the business? We started in 2008. Okay, and so, so we have whatever. To do it math. You have to do that math. Mm -hmm. and this, I don't this is do a hard that. time at night to do math. Yeah, not on camera. Not on. How many years? <laughs> this will be our 14th year. <laughs> okay, and so are, is it still your family at the helm? Um, I think there was somebody, somebody a, a friend of Alan's who became a huge part of it. So he yeah. wasn't family, but almost, right? Right, and so um, actually, uh, Probably a couple of years ago, Alan and Sarah stepped back and we hired a CEO. And so, um, and then we have just recently undergone an additional CEO change. That oh. CEO was in there five years he, and he is off doing other things now. And so we just recently hired a new CEO okay. because, you know, your business gets to a certain point and we're a family and we don't know about, you know, like, you know, if you have to hire somebody who is, a, um, what is the person who's over the people? You know, HR. the HR person. And it can't be your friend who's nice to people. It has to be somebody <laughs> yeah. who knows the law, right. you know? And so these are big hires. And yeah. so uh, as we start doing these bigger hires, you know, we have more people, people in that, that upper echelon. And so while I am the face of the company and I still do the weekly tutorials and all that, I mean, we have a marketing team and a, you know, and a film team and a, we have all the teams, you know, wow. an IT team. We and have you all didn't the even teams. hire an HR person until you had 115 employees, right? It so was, we had a few employees and Alan for a long time, he was always the bad guy, you know, he did all that work and it was so hard for him because he's pretty joyful, but he was willing to take that on because somebody Somebody has to do that, you know, and I'm, I'm not that, you know. <laughs> well, you know, this is kind of getting ahead of That's us a little bit. That's the hard part of business, though. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure it's very difficult. But um, so I want to back up just a little bit because, you know, the book does go from your childhood all the way to present day. I mean, you, you do the entire thing. So, so you didn't grow up Sewing. I mean, you grew up sewing, but your your mother didn't sew, no, right? No, my mother didn't sew. My grandmother think, didn't sew. I think you wrote that your your first memories of sewing were for dolls, and it was only sewing in quotation marks, right? right. Because you, you you were using glue oh, I was and stapling staples, yes, and I think we taping, did that too in our house. Scissors, you know, whatever I could find my hands on. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I don't know if I told in this the book this, but uh, I can remember cutting. I, the only material I had was my mother's clothing, and so I would just cut small pieces. Did she know? Well, when she found it, she was quite quite upset. <laughs> you know, I only did that twice. I got in big trouble for that. But as soon as I was 10, they enrolled me in 4-H because then I could sew and I could learn to sew. And, you know, that was a huge blessing for me, 4-H was, you know, so. But I would, we would go, I remember as a kid, we would, to the churches would have bazaars mm -hmm. and these little grandma ladies would make and that's very stereotypical because it probably wasn't, but to me they seemed very grandma-ish because I was a little girl, but they would make these Barbie clothes and you could buy, you know, like a little, like a whole little outfit Barbie thing. It was pretty, it was pretty cool. And I wanted to make those. I knew somebody was making them, you know, and so, yeah, I had to refine that quite a bit. Those tiny seams are a little bit harder than, <laughs> than I, 
I wanted to take on at that time. And then so as you grew up, the, the sewing sort of became not only something you enjoyed, but a real necessity, right? Then oh my gosh, yes. And so I, I sewed everything for our children. I think I invented the no-show no socks, you know, because I bought all the boys the long tube socks. And then as they wore out the toes, I'd just sew a seam across there and they'd get shorter and shorter and shorter <laughs> until they were, they were just down in their shoes, you know. But everything I sewed, I made, you know, my kids couldn't figure out how to make a bed to please me. And so I would literally make a quilt top and, but I didn't know it was a quilt top. It was just like pieces I was putting together and a blanket and a sheet and I would put them all together, sew it all together and they would, could pull up one thing, you know, and, um, and I dressed my kids alike often if they needed clothing, you know, this one's pants became this one's shorts, you know, I could, I mean, you know, talk about the, the vintage, you know, the sewing, you know, the recreating one thing from another. I mean, imagining. That, oh, it was my gift. Yeah. And, and everything was secondhand to begin with. And so I'd like the sleeves off of this one, would go on the top of this one, and this would become a dress for this one, you know, and I love that. That was a very, very creative thing for me to do. But when they get to be about six foot five, they won't wear matching clothing anymore. They no, just that's refuse. a hard sell. <laughs> hard sell. They don't like it at all. <laughs> and so this was all in California, pretty close to Monterey, I guess, for geographic reference. And then at some point, you and Ron said, now hang on here. Why do we keep living in this place it's that's so such hard, a high yeah. cost of living? And so then can you talk about what happened? How did you end up in Missouri? Well, there were several things that happened that changed your mindset. One was Ron turned 40. And I don't know what happens to men when they turn 40, but they're just like a little reevaluation of their well, life happens. I think I did that too. You know, for yeah. me, it was like, it was like 41 because <laughs> I realized that I, in a few years I would be 50 and 50 was my parents' age. You know, that was hard for me. But, you know, he kind of did this whole reevaluation thing. And then our, our, our littlest boy got a tumor. And life, when your kids get sick, life gets really mortal for you and you think about things differently. Um, we had a gang problem in our town and so our kids came home from school and we started homeschooling them. And, um, and so there was just this whole big shuffle that happened. And all of a sudden we were like, you know what? We, we don't have to live here, you know? And Ron had um, lived in the Midwest for a couple of years and he really loved it. He loved the Midwest. And so he was like, we should try the Midwest. And I was like, thanks Ron. I was like, where is that exactly? You know, cause I'd, I didn't know anything about, I mean, we'd, I had maybe been to Nevada just over the border, you know, for a high school competition. Not you know. mid anyway. No. no, I had never been out there. <laughs> and so um, that we just kind of decided to give it a try. Give it a try. We hoped things were cheaper. We hoped I was kind of an oddball in California, too, because I had a big family. You know, I had a garden. I sewed. I canned. I did all the things. And honestly, when we moved to the Midwest, I found out I was a slacker. <laughs> you weren't an oddball <laughs> at all. not an oddball. <laughs> Within the first couple of days, I was like, you could bury me here. You know, I just, <laughs> oh, I love that. I love the Midwest. I've just never looked back for one moment. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so once you move to Hamilton, you describe what you find there and that your kids think they're in the Wild West. They do. And they're just astonished. Can you kind of describe what you found there and maybe compare it to what Hamilton's like today? After you, pretty much, your family changed the town, too. We did, but, but the, the air, Hamilton and the area around it largely remains the same. You know, we're one of the largest counties in Missouri. We're one of the poorest counties in Missouri. There are 11 towns in our county, and Hamilton is the biggest with 1,500. And so most of the towns have, like, 87, 210. You know, I mean, they're just little, they're wow. little tiny places where there's only a couple of houses left. And that's how the towns in the Midwest go. If they're not growing, then they're dying. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we wanted Hamilton to survive. And that wasn't our intention when we came. It wasn't how we thought things were going to go. But, um, but what did you find when you got there, though? So when we got here, literally, it was one gas station. And um, we, had, we had found a place on the map. And we thought we were going to go there. And then we thought there was a town there because it was on the map. So and it was sort just of literally dirt. Pointed to a Hamilton spot. was the next closest place. So we drove over there. And we asked if there was a realtor in town. And of course, the answer was, well, there's a guy who dabbles in that over on the golfy. And we're, so we go to the door, we're like, I understand you're a realtor. Well, from time to time, you know. And um, I talked him, really slowly. Yes. And, <laughs> and, you know, and it's like uh, just a few streets and gravel, a lot of gravel streets, uh -huh. you know, and um, animals, you know. We, I mean, my kids thought all food came out of the freezer. You know, we live in a city, you know, it's not, not a big animal area, you know. And so uh, the animals were fascinating to the children. And, you know, you think in California, you, you know, you think about a, 
a pig, but it's like, I mean, pigs in, in <laughs> Missouri and Kansas, they're enormous. You could ride hog. them. Sure. You could ride them, you know. <laughs> no, those weren't pot bellies. There. No, no. Yeah. And so, um, so everything was like this new, amazing thing for us. And, um, and so the, yeah, you know, I, I can't, I can't even remember where I was going with that, but well, I just it was, wondered what Hamilton was, pretty, was like when you got there. It was, it was pretty, pretty wild, wild west, <laughs> you know, and the kids, the kids loved the, they loved the area. They went fishing, you know, they'd never, they'd never gone fishing, you know. And, and that so-called real estate agent actually let you live in his house, well, right? Yeah, we said we need a rental. And he was like, um, well, it'll probably take me about a week to find you someplace. To live. And I said, right, well, point me to a hotel. And he's like, oh, there are no hotels here. Yeah, and then here are the nine and, of you in a van. Yeah, yes, and he's like, well, y'all can just stay with us. And I'm just like, uh, you know, if that had happened in California, I would have thought this man is nuts. We're this, we're in deep trouble, you know. But but somehow it seemed normal. And they had a bunch of children, and they had a three bedroom house. Little they pulled mattresses out from under beds, and little they took care of us, fed us. Our kids had played a birthday with their party. Kids. Had a birthday party for Hillary. It was her birthday, you know. That's uh, amazing. A couple of days later, yeah, they were just wonderful, really wonderful. And it, everybody waved to everybody. Everybody knew everybody. You know, I mean, within a, which just within a very short time, um, we became enmeshed in that community, and it was just, it was just amazing for us. And we then that's it. when, when you found quilting. Yes. Right? So I actually went. My background was in musical theater and costuming. Uh huh. You know, I I'm going to ask you to read about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you can you can talk about the costuming. Yeah. So th that was once the children wouldn't. Uh, yeah. I mean, sewing is my go-to. It's what I do when I'm happy, sad, anxious. It's my go-to. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, um, I love to sew, and so I had to find another outlet for that, and I was already involved in musical theater, and so I offered to become their costumer. And so I costumed for them, and when we went to Missouri, I literally went right to the theater and said, I can be your costumer. They're like, well, we do one show a year, and we probably don't need you. And, uh, and that's when I, I was just like, but I've got to sew things. I, I, can't, I can't wear that many outfits, you know? And, um, and they said, well, you should take a quilting class, and I literally said these words. Old people do that. <laughs> I was 37, yeah. you know, and they were like, "No, it's a real creative thing." And there's a class on it over at the Votech in Chillicothe, and I was like, mm. "But and before I, that, you had your neighbor Ralph introduce you oh, yes. to his mom, right?" Yes, and his that's mother, what I yeah. wondered if you would read from, because that seemed so. From that here, really seemed like the aha moment. About it was quilting. an aha moment. It wasn't long before Ralph invited me over to the main house to meet his sweet mother, Mildred. At the time, Mildred was in her late 80s, and right away when I sat down to talk, I noticed the gorgeous quilt she had on her sofa. Wow, I said, this is really beautiful. Thank you, she said, and she showed me a few more she'd made too. I was still sewing, making, fixing, stitching all the time, but I hadn't really been interested in making quilts, and as soon as I saw her quilts, I thought, I said, Mildred, I really want to learn to quilt. Do you, do you think you could teach me? Oh, I would love to, she said. I said, so what fabrics do I need? And this is so, so interesting, because she's like, well, we just use old clothes and stuff, scraps and pieces, that sort of thing. And I was like, well, I, you know, I have a pretty big fab fabric stash, so I can probably come up with something like that. I said, my sewing machine is kind of heavy, though. Do you want me to do it at my house or yours? Oh, honey, I don't use a sewing machine. I, do, I hand stitch everything. I thought about that for about a minute, and then I looked at her and I said, you know what, Mildred, with all these kids, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have the time to sit down and sew things by hand, but thank you. As much as I admired her handwork and the detail on those beautiful quilts, I knew that my brain didn't work that way. For decades, I had been operating on only snippets of time to accomplish things, which is why I learned to do everything so quickly. My talent was in creating shortcuts, cooking shortcuts, sewing shortcuts, fixing shortcuts. Time may move much slower in Missouri, but that didn't mean my brain could slow down. Thankfully, Mildred wasn't offended, and she hadn't any neighbors for a very long time, so she was thrilled just to have the company. She, oh, I loved her so much, and she was, she was just one of those women of the land, you know, I mean, she could do anything, and um, her quilts, she had a, she didn't give them away to people, though, she, they were all to be saved and distributed upon her death. Wow. You know, so when I die, she would say, this, this, has, this person's name is on it, and this person's name is on it, and um, I actually... I actually really didn't want that. I wanted mine to be enjoyed and loved. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was making things to sit on a shelf. I wanted my stuff to be used and loved and worn out. And well, and what so I really it's a different, different thought process. And what I really love about that passage too is that you wanted to do it your way. You wanted to make it easy 
and because you wanted to do it. And so if you hadn't made it easy, then you wouldn't have been able to do this thing that you really wanted to do. Um, and that worked into your business model too. Well, and after, after I finished that class over in Chillicothe, I joined up with a group of ladies in that area who quilted. And I would say to them, well, can I do it like this? And they would be like, well, yeah, I guess that works, you know, but they, they were rule followers and I didn't have any rules and I didn't read patterns. You didn't and know so better. I didn't know any better, so I was just doing it <laughs> yeah. how I did it, you know. Right. And so in that class in Chillicothe, you were supposed to make, what was it, one quilt over eight weeks and you made six? At least, yeah. <laughs> At least six. So every time I'd go home, and this was a um, log cabin quilt, and I did not know that there were books written about it. You know, I was just taking a class from this teacher and literally I would take my blocks home and she had a plan for how she was, I mean, she's teaching a class. Mm -hmm. So this was how it was going to be done. But I would just turn those blocks and a whole new something would appear and I would be, I was so stunned, I would sew it up. And then I'd be like, well, I have, I can't go back to class without my blocks. So I'd make a new set of blocks and go back to class, you know. And uh, by the end of it, yeah, I had probably made about six, at least six, if not more. Well, that's amazing. I just couldn't get over it. <laughs> Well, and so just to, just to tie that together a little bit and, and how it kind of got into, um, to, well, what you did later with the business and just wondered if you'd read one more part and okay. I won't ask you to read again. Oh, no, I don't mind at all. Um, it was not long after opening that I realized there had been a deep passion in the quilting world for many years, maybe decades, even centuries, to make quilting seem really, really hard. The general feeling in the quilting world was that everything had to be perfect, which made it so difficult it was almost unattainable. If your stitches weren't straight or your corners weren't aligned or your designs weren't symmetrical, some old school teachers would make you rip out the stitches and do it again. I met a whole lot of neighbors and friends and the occasional walk-in customer who carried around the feeling of, I really can't do this, it's not my thing. But they could do it, I thought. It was only their, that their desire had been beaten dead by the old rules and the old ways of doing things, and that was just not me. After the kids grew up, I had more time on my hands and I had made so many quilts that I would never, I could never have afforded to have them all machine quilted, even if the long armors were too backed up. So I had taken to hand quilting as Ralph's mother Mildred had done with her quilt back in the day when we lived at the farmhouse. There was one big difference though, hand my hand stitching was anything but amazing. I mean, a beginner could have done as good a job as I did. To be fair, I was a beginner. Uh, I wasn't worried about it being perfect though. I was worried about it getting done quickly and making sure it held together because it was going on a bed to keep somebody warm or into the hands of a child they could drag around with them wherever they went. All I wanted for my quilts was for them to be loved and used. And as a few more people started trickling into the shop to see what I was up to, I realized a lot of them found that interesting and freeing. And when I told them I was a utilitarian quilter, I explained to them and explained to them what that meant to me. To help break down the old and intimidating way of doing things even more, I compiled examples of all the little quick tricks and shortcuts I had come up with over the years. So when someone said, oh, I can't make a quilt, it's just too complicated, I would say, can I just show you something from the drawer of knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> well, so can you, are there any, is there anything behind us from the drawer of knowledge that you can point out? Like, can you tell me how? Yes, so the, this is a block that is known as a half square triangle. Okay. And they're actually on a lot of quilts that we make. And a half square triangle is generally made by cutting out the two triangles and sewing them together. And what I did was I would take two squares of fabric together and sew all the way around the outside and then cut them diagonally and I'd get four. And so just without ever cutting a triangle, you know, all of a sudden I had these four and now I, I, have a, I have a thing where I can do it with eight and I can do, make 16 out of two squares without ever cutting the triangles. And so, you know, those little shortcuts, people were just like, wait, wait, what? You know, and I'd say, and then you have four. And, and that's that, what your YouTube tutorials are all about, yeah. right? Yeah, right? absolutely. So, and then so when, now we're getting to the business part, so how we actually set up the business, it was Alan, I think, right, who noticed that the, this, you mentioned the long arm sewing machine. Yes. That there was just one in the area and, and it was very, very backed up or something like yeah, that. So, Can you say what that is? So um, there is, there's these long arm machines. They're about 12, 14 feet long and they actually put all the three layers together. So you have your top, you have your batting in the middle, and then you have a backing, and they actually are what makes the stitch all over the top of the quilts like this that hold all the layers together. And so they, um, most of them at the time, a lot of the machines were just handheld. So they did their own pattern, their own design, or they would have a pattern that they laid out and tried to follow on the design. So there was a gal who did them over in, in Kidder, and she was the one I used, and she was fairly reasonable, and I only did one every once in a while because I really couldn't afford 
to um, get them done. And if you're a piecer like me, you have a bin of quilts ready to go to the quilter at all, at any given time. There's always a bunch. And so um, the kids asked me what quilt it was that I was going to get. And I said, I don't even remember because it's been there a long time. Well, how long? And I'm like, probably a year. And they were like, why? Is she really slow? And I'm like, no, they just have a lot of work because not a lot of people do this, you know. And you said, and, wait a second. And Alan, Alan said, his, you know, the, he, he's always thinking, bing, 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 you know, and he's like, could you do that? And I was like, well, I can sew, you know, but I really wasn't sure I could do it. And especially then when they spent the extra money and got the computerized one, because it's literally a CNC machine. Um, and so it, the fact that it, it would do it on its own, I was really, I wasn't, I'm not very tech savvy and I wasn't sure I could do all the computer things. But the guy But it wasn't me, just that. It was that they had to remortgage their houses, didn't they? So Sarah did, yes. She took out a mortgage on her house to buy the machine. And, um, and literally, it came to our house. It was too big for our house. We had to buy a building. The building was actually cost less than the machine did. Oh my gosh. But we, now we had a business. You know, we had a machine in a building and we had a business. And so where before it was just gonna be me and my house doing a couple, you know, whatever anybody wanted to bring to me, as long as I did a couple a week, we could make the payment on the machine and we could add to our little nest egg. And so you just didn't know? No, we just didn't realize. And, and There's a part in the book where I think you have, here and there in the book, you have Alan or Ron or somebody else um, write a paragraph and Alan said something in, the, in one of his passages that said, you know, if somebody came to me now and said, yes. here's what I'm gonna do, I'd <laughs> say, no, that that's a terrible idea. And so well, did it, it feel like that for a while once you did for that? It didn't for me. For me, honestly, it just felt like playing house. You know, I had a little business, I had a little machine, and I thought if I can just teach people how to quilt online, then they'll send me their quilts and then I can quilt them and that's how I'll make their money. And that was I'm, his idea too, to teach online, Oh, to go right? online was totally his idea. So at that time, so this was in um, 2008, but at that time, Alan had, computers were not, I mean, I would say probably maybe 70% of houses had one, but you know, computers were new in our children's lifetime, in my children's lifetime. They were not a thing when we started out with children. And Alan was that computer kid. He was the kid I spent his whole childhood saying, get off the computer and go do something. You know, I've had to apologize to him now many times uh, because we work for him. And, and he was that computer kid. And so when he bought the machine, he went right away to online to see what had happened to it and uh, with, if, see if, what, if quilting was online. And he said, it really hasn't made the jump. Do you wanna do tutorials? And I said, sure, what is a tutorial? And he's like, I want you to teach people to quilt online. And I said, well, where people find this? And he said, oh, it'll be on YouTube. And YouTube was one year old. Wow. And I said to him, Alan, isn't that where all the crazy teenagers put their stuff? I'm pretty sure you don't want your mom on YouTube. And he's like, no, mom, you're gonna to have to trust me on this. It's gonna be our center for learning. And I was like, <laughs> Alan, nobody my age is ever going to go to the computer to learn anything. Well, this is what people are saying about TikTok now. Right? So I th are you on TikTok? I am. Oh, of course My you granddaughters are. run okay. it, and they have me do crazy things. And oh. so <laughs> it's just what I do. I'm obedient. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, yeah, so it's the, it's the same type of thing. And so we started doing these tutorials online, and that really was what propelled our business forward. Because if, we, up until then, we were just that one little shop in that one little town. Well, that's what I was going to say. So at first, you, so you have this building that you've bought, and you've, this giant investment, because it's a building and a long-arm sewing machine that's huge, and nobody came, right? No, no. I mean, how and, long was it like well, that? Well, they were curious. So we, did, we, did a, we put paper over the windows. Anytime you paper over a window in a little town, everybody wants to know what's happening. Okay. And so we, like, you know, we had a little bit of you know, interest going on. And people came, and it wasn't very long into it where I was helping my friend put together a museum in uh, one of the other little towns. And there were all these books of all these clubs. Women had so many clubs, like in the 30s and the 20s, just so they could get together and do things. And I thought, maybe women just need to get together. And so I offered a free Friday night sew. And I said, just come, bring your mending, bring your knitting, crocheting, I don't care what you bring, just come, bring a snack, and we're gonna get together and have a Friday night sew. Well, that first week, we literally, you know, we just, we didn't have very much. We had a couple of shelves of fabric and that was it, but we pushed everything back, put tables up so people could sit around, and it was so much fun. And that just was just huge. It became huge very fast, and pretty soon I said to Ron, we need another building, another room. And so he like, 
We like put, they put up some sheetrock walls. We didn't even paint them, threw some carpet down on the cement, and we filled that room. And then I, that very night, I said to Ron, we need another room. And he just kept putting up more, because we were in this long garage, which the middle of it was still dirt, you know, but um, on this side and that side, there were these little showrooms. And so we just kept adding on this other bigger room. And, um, and it just grew so fast because people just love to get together. And then I would show them a trick or something like that. And it was during this time that we started doing things doing tutorials and they started following it and somebody would say, well, if you want to know how to do that, she has a li little class on this on the computer. You can go watch it and it doesn't That's cost the computer. It doesn't cost anything, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. And so that was a big deal, you know, and I um, and so, you know, I, one day a lady called and she's like, you know, that class that you taught, I want some of that fabric that you showed. And I'm like, well, that's my fabric. And they're like, no, I want to buy some. But I'm like, it's mine. You can't have it, you know? And they were like, well, where did you get it, you know? And I mean, just anybody who has fabric, you know, we're like in the third bin, the flat folds, you know, down here. And I was like, 1984, Ben Franklin. And she goes, is that true? And I'm like, I don't know. Nobody knows where they got that fabric, you know? But, but uh, you know, I said to the kids, we should probably sell fabric. But we discovered very quickly that was not something we really thought we could afford. Um, and then a salesman came, you know, with, with the pre-cuts, and we figured out that if we bought these pre-cuts, we could buy a bolt to finish, to put a border on, you know, and make the quilt out of this little, you know, pre-cut is a one square fabric from the whole line, so 42 squares, you know, in these little packs, and then we had a bolt that you could border it with, and you could finish a project. And so that worked so well with my... Um, with your shortcuts, right? With my right? shortcut brain, yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. put those online, and I think you, it was the same deal where it didn't catch on immediately. You had a sale from your niece or something like that. So, yeah, then, one of the funniest things that happened, though, was layer cakes are about, because they're about th a total of three yards of fabric. So, they're, so they're, a layer cake is a stack of squares? It's a stack of 10-inch squares, okay. 10 inches, mm -hmm. you know, and um, 42 pieces. Mm -hmm. And so um, Alan put them up, and he mistakenly put them up for 88 cents instead of, they should have been like, I, I think I think retail on them would be close thirty five dollars, forty dollars, oh, something gosh. like that. And the he, daily deal, huh? And he put them up for eighty eight cents, <laughs> and we had bought eight of them. And he's like, "What do I do? They all sold like really fast." And I said, "Well, you know, we talked about it, and it was like, well, we could we could call all those people and tell them we made a mistake." You know, I said, or you can let it go and everybody will call, be calling everybody saying, you've got to go look on this site because it's so cheap, you know, and that really played out for us. Wow. You know, and so people started looking at what we were doing and it was, it was very fun. So you it was know, really, it was, very, the, it was a the good business thing. And I mean, it's just the things that I love about the story are just that you did it your way. You did it with your family. Everything was so organic. And you made it really easy. Yeah. So like the entire thing is organic and relatable and, uh, I, and, it just and, keeps and as a bigger, problem right? came up, we just solved it. And we just, you know, we were very transparent about, you know, what we were doing and how things were going. And, and as we grew, you know, it's like, you know, we're doing this, this, and this, you know. And, um, and we just had to get, we just had to figure it out as we went along. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, Alan, honestly, he, I know he thought that um, this was just a little thing for his mom. He wasn't, he wasn't like... He was keeping you busy because the kids were out of the house, He was right? keeping me busy, but he wasn't, he wasn't like thinking it was gonna be anything. And I remember he, one time he came home and he says, he was talking to one of the mentors because he loves to start businesses, you know, and he's an entrepreneur and he's doing all these different things. And they were like, tell me about some of your business. And he goes, well, I heard you had a quilting something. And he's like, yeah, I did this thing for my mom. And he's telling him about the quilting thing. And he said, do you know what an entrepreneur would give? They give their eye teeth to have a, a business that had that kind of momentum. And he said, it made me just step back and go, Maybe I should really look at this, you know? And so they started really paying attention to it. And, That's amazing. And honestly, if it were me, I'd still be in that one building because I'm real happy in the here and now. Uh -huh. It was my kids who were betting the farm every week, you know, willing to take those risks. And I'm going, okay, okay, oh. it seems a little scary to me, but okay, you know. And Ugh. it's worked and it just it keeps has getting just bigger. It's worked, yeah. Well, I want to take some questions from the audience now. Um, um, one person has asked Is this there where they are or this one? Well, Where's my audience? Where am I looking at? What am I looking at? Either one, okay. <laughs> uh, well, somebody wants to know um, about the, it, did you know that, uh, about the connection between J.C. Penney and Hamilton at the time you moved there, and have you taken advantage of that in any way? No, we didn't know about that connection, um, but it's a fun connection. So it was, it's his birthplace, and, um, and the only thing we've really done with that is that the J.C. Penney company their corporate people have come out a couple of times 
Um, he had his 500th store there in Hamilton, and, um, and that was the, the Penny's quilt shop, and we named that after him. And then they did give us some old memorabilia that hangs in, the, in that Penny's quilt shop, and that's where all of our solid fabrics are. But we didn't really, we didn't really know about the connection before we came, but um, I wouldn't say we've taken advantage of it, but we've enjoyed it. You know, it's, it's just a little bit fun. You know, there's a Penny Museum, his childhood homes are there, you know, and that little, they, one of those little homes they've moved into town, so now it's part of our downtown. And That's really fun. It's very fun, yeah. Well, I can see on, on the YouTube chat, there's lots of people, are, you have your fans. Your fans <laughs> are here saying how much they love the They're shortcuts. They're so kind to me. They just love it. Um, I have one person on here who would like you to talk a little bit about how you give back to the community. We do give back to the community. So um, whenever we have an event, most of our events are centered around, if we raise money for anything, it's generally for the food pantry or a local women's shelter. We do a lot of things for the, the local companies, which are the local um, charities that are around there, which the quilters love. They're such givers, you know, they're so kind. And, um, and so we also have a, uh, a part of our company that is, that is a give back part, and they give uh, four, four sums of money a year to different charities that we choose and we wanna to give to. So there's a lot of giving that goes on at Missouri Star. And um, like we actually put the sidewalks in for the town, Missouri Star did. Did you we really? We put in two streets, you know, and um, we just, you know, we do what we can to make the, the community nice. We put the rails in, we always put flowers up and down Main Street, you know, that's all Missouri Star. That's oh, not wow. A, that's not the city proper. But um, we recently have a, uh, in the last few years, we've had a city planner, which hasn't, you know, in the, these little towns, you know, you don't always have that. And so that's been, it's been nice for us because it levels the playing field. You know, everybody gets treated the same and it's not just if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Who knows you know. a don. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. That's so that's great. It's, it's pretty fun to give back that way too. And somebody else would like to know if you're planning on continuing the triple play those are my favorites. Yes. So what is the triple are. play? So I actually brought the triple play on. So I do a tutorial every single Friday. And um, as I get older, you know, I thought it would be nice to bring in two, a couple more faces so that if I do want to phase out some of my time and not do something every single week of my life, you know, um, that I would have these other two faces. And so I brought in my daughter and my daughter-in-law. And what we do is we choose something that is like an ordinary quilt block, like say it's the churn dash quilt block. And then we will each come up with our own take on it, you know, and maybe Miss Deal make it tiny, or maybe I'll cut it in four places, or maybe, you know, you just never know what we're gonna That's do. That's the triple play. And so the okay. triple play is three different ideas based on one thing. And, and they do, people love seeing all the different ideas. And honestly, you know, people say, do you talk to each other? Do you know each other? And it's sometimes, but mostly, you know, like I'm there watching, you know, as we're filming it, you know, Misty will say, well, this is how I did that. And I was like, oh, I would have never done that that way. You know, and I just love how we all have different brains. So we all learn differently. And it's just fun to see that happening with, um, with what's happening up on, you know, when we're filming. And so, yeah, I love triple play. It's my favorite. I could, okay, I so would you're do, not, those aren't going no, away. No, no, those okay, are not good, going away. Okay, good, good, good. We might try a double play on, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or, or quadruple. Misty has a new show. She has a show on Monday called At Home with Misty. Oh, my goodness. You know, and so she's got her own. And then Natalie has a little show called um, final stitch and uh, it's it's you know her just teaching you know because she's much more where I'm more goofy and more fun and more laid back she's she's really smart and so she'll say like all right so if, this is how you do this but if you want to really get it exactly right here's what you do you know <laughs> so she takes that a step further for those people who want that and oh they love that too <laughs> Well, here's somebody who wants to make certain that your family actually does still own the business. We do. We you still do. own the business, 100%. 100%. Uh, okay. Um, and how about, what are the advantages and disadvantages of having your quilting business headquartered in a small rural town? So the advantages um, are wonderful. Uh, you know, it's a little town. Uh, you have a lot of control. Um, the biggest disadvantage for us is their, their employee pool is really shallow. Hmm. And so um, we have about 450 employees. And, um, and we have never stopped hiring. You know, we need people all the time. And, uh, and so, you know, it's not like we live, live near a college or anything like that where we have a big pool to draw from. So we have a lot of people who are remote, but we also have a lot of people who drive up from Kearney, Excelsior, the city. We have a lot of people who live in the city. You know, and some of them will come up, 
you know, like uh, three days a week, you know, and then they're home two days and, you know, they work, they work five days, but they're remote a couple of days. But the hardest thing for us to find really is that, um, you know, the, the people who ship, who cut the fabric, who work in the warehouse, you know, those are, those are big jobs. And we don't start out at minimum wage and everybody gets insurance. You know, we have a lot of really good perks for our people. We, we want to take care of our people. We realize that all of those people are connected to a family that they take care of and that that's, that's important to us, you know, that they're able to do that. We even have the college willing to come, they would come down and teach um, classes so that people could get their degrees if they wanted to, oh, you know. Wow. And we've seen some wonderful, you know, for me the, the biggest compliment is that kid who comes in who doesn't think he can really do anything and then he really finds his love and he can do it. And at our company, we have, they have to work at a job for six months, but then they can go, if they want to be a videographer, they could, they could go apply for that team or if they want to be on the construction crew or if they want to be, you know, whatever they want to do, they can try and apply and go and try these other things. And when they find what they love, it's such a compliment to me that they then will go out into what they call the real world and get a real job. What they don't realize is this is a real job, but then they can go on and do something more. And they're so proud of themselves. And I'm so proud of them. You know, I beg them to stay. You know, please, please just stay here and don't leave us. But at the same time, I'm super proud of them because they've become what they didn't know they could be. And that's really cool for me. That's so, very, very yeah, cool. I love that. Well, let's take one more question and then and we'll say good night and you can Already? go on to your date night. <laughs> Already? <laughs> so, so one viewer has noticed something called a peace quilt. Or, oh, this peace quilt over here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I, now I see it. I couldn't yeah. see it from this angle. Um, can you tell us how that came about? So we have uh, our birthday bash every year is themed. And so we do this big theme. And this year it was a 70s theme. And so we, you know, we all took a, a, a you know, a, page from the 70s book and we dressed up in our hippie clothes and our tie dyed all our shirts were tie dyed and we have a huge amount of people that come to Hamilton during that time and we do a quilt auction and uh, and for the quilt auction I decided that I wanted to make this piece quilt and it's a giant it's a pattern I don't remember the gal's name I wish I did but we have it on our line it's called pieces piece in pieces okay and so this is a little baby version this of it? This is a little small version okay. because I have a, I like to hang quilts on my porch and outside my studio, I have a small brick wall that has a, um, a hanger on it and I hang little quilts out there. So during that time, I loved to hang my piece quilt. And I love the idea that, um, that you can, I mean, I can, this piece quilt shows that, you know, I want that for the world. And it's, it's a statement to the world when I show that. And so this is literally all scraps from my, um, you know, when I do binding, which is the little edge on the quilt right here, mm -hmm. it's two and a half inches. And when I get done, I always have a piece about this long and I throw it into a basket. And so I made a huge piece quilt that was just multicolored of all these colored that we sold at the auction. And the proceeds of that went to, um, went to our food pantry. But people love the idea that they have scraps of mine, some of my scraps. And so it went, it went for a, a good price, which I'm glad because it, it super helps our, um, our county. There's a lot of need in our county, and that was fun. But that's where that's from. It's just from our birthday bash. And I don't know what our theme for this year is, but I always try to make something that goes along with that. Um, what month is theme. that? It's in September. September, okay. The, the third weekend in September okay. or fourth. Third, third. Uh oh. I don't know. Check the calendar. I'm always there. That's okay. all I know. Yeah, just watch for it online. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for driving all this way and oh, joining it's my us. Pleasure. And, and it's been really great to have you. And, it's been so fun. And I hope that you'll go on uh, and f to the Kansas City Public Library YouTube page and see these comments because oh, a lot I'd of people have written to say how much they enjoy your oh, work. Thank and, you so much, you guys. Yeah. They really, they really are so kind to me, and, um, and it just is one of the sweetest things to me, really. It's, it is. Uh, it's a pretty amazing how, uh, but what big heart quilters have. And they're just so generous and kind. You know, literally 80% of everything they make goes to somebody else. Oh, that's amazing. And that is just the sweetest thing. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> well, they're, thank you. they're wonderful. Thank you very much for joining oh, us. Thank and you good for night, having everybody. Me. Good night, everybody.